next, uh, next speaker is Daniel Faber. I'll uh, give you the bio on him. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. It's, uh, yeah, okay, right. Uh, Daniel's too young for half of this. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, engineer, tradition in the new, uh, sorry, tradition breaker in the new space and micro space industry. His career has covered all aspects of spacecraft, business from marketing and finance, rocket science to orbit mechanics, to microelectronics and spacecraft integration. He's designed, built and operated some of the world's most interesting space junk, including the world's smallest space telescopes. Let's tell us about that. Uh, and tiny space wheel, uh, satellite wheels. Most satellites have wheels. Uh, during periods of boredom, he has tinkered with launching satellites from giant guns and hypervelocity crash landers for the moon. Then started a company to use benchtop nuclear fusion reactors as analytical instruments for the mining industry. Since then, he has come down to earth a little with a great Jan King on a KA band Leo Constellation communication system for Antarctica and for a short while working systems engineer with the VKI Institute on the QB50 project. It's a lot of stuff you done, isn't it? Um, his, other in, sorry, his other spacecraft uh, projects include the MOS and Neosat astronomy microsatellites, the 5 kilogram bright nanosatellite astronomy mission, and design, assembly, integration and testing of avionics for an orbiting habitation module. Daniel was brought up in the wilds of Tasmania and holds a bachelor's degree in engineering in mechatronics, is it? And the University of New South Wales. His talk will explain the lessons learned during all these activities across all, almost every continent. So, do you do explain this a lot? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I'll give you Daniel. <laughs> um, I think somebody found that online and glued it together. I'll try and be a little more brief. But <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, all hearing me good? Yep, yeah. no one's excellent. Um, <laughs> so some, um, the idea was to, to present some, some lessons learned and a, and a bit of a crystal ball gazing into um, where microsatellites and nanosatellites are going. Uh, I'm currently working at, uh, at ISIS, end-to-end um, -end small satellite solutions. They, uh, they sponsored me to get here, so I, they deserve the plug. Um, CubeSats are us. Uh, this is some of the stuff that uh, I've had fun with that was mentioned. Um, the, the, I need a pointer. Do we have a pointer? Anyway, over the, there's a whole bunch of subsystems and then some, some satellites, 50 kilogram microsatellites that did uh, sub arc second uh, pointing to, to look at how stars wobble. Uh, and then a, a satellite similar kind of size to search for asteroids. Um, this is the, the little 5 to 8 kilogram um, uh, astronomy satellite with its tiny little telescope in there. It's about 20 centimeter cube. And that's uh, uh, coming about 10 years later than this one over here to do the same mission. So we've gone from 50 kilograms down to, or 60 kilograms down to about 8 kilograms and the technology moves on. So there's a constellation of six of those at the moment. Um, there may be more going up. There are good reasons to get big ones. There are good reasons to get small ones. They both have their place. Um, yeah, habit habitation modules. Um, I uh, was lucky enough to work with Bigelow Aerospace. This is the Antarctic Broadband thing, looking at KA band uh, for Antarctica. Uh, and then at ISIS, we were putting together a, uh, a little AIS satellite at the moment. Um, so those are some of the things that I've tinkered with. There's lots to do in, uh, in microspace. Um, so what is this microspace thing and, and microsatellites and nanosatellites that have no relation to millionths and billionths? Um, for some reason, it's a, an order of 10. Um, we needed some, some words to describe them, and, uh, and clearly micro and then nano were the buzzwords of the day. Uh, but what it really is about is a philosophy and a new way to do things. Um, switching with, uh, with microsatellites was, uh, was looking at a, a virtuous cycle versus a, a death, death spiral. Uh, people have described the big space industry as launching um, big satellites that cost a lot infrequently, therefore having to put as much as you could on them and making them more complex and uh, therefore needing more testing and therefore they're more expensive and therefore you can't afford them so you launch them less frequently and therefore you amortize your development of the rocket over less launches and the cycle repeats. Um, aha, excellent. So the, the microsatellites, uh, by dint of being smaller, um, we can launch more of them more often 
and, uh, and get more experience so that when we do the next one, um, it's been a short time since we did the last one, we can carry that experience over, improve the systems, make them smaller, launch them more often, and go around a, a positive cycle. So that was, that was how people have, have described the microspace philosophy. It's not about size, it's about doing things quickly, size helps. Uh, what CubeSats have done, which is, is really interesting, taking that to another level, is allow a, a natural selection to go on where you can have incredible variation because it doesn't cost a lot to, to have that variation. And then things fail and get selected and culled out, and then some of them survive. And those ones, we, uh, we, we keep going, we build variations on those. And uh, as long as we can tolerate the failures, as long as we can make the mistakes and not have our industry collapse, or not have the company or, or the university collapse or, or the team fall apart, then we can keep going very quickly and very rapidly work our way through a, a sort of random process to, uh, to systems that are more and more complex, more and more reliable, uh, have a lot more capability. So I'll have some things about CubeSats and where they're going and, and uh, that's where we are. But the big thing is it's not about size, it's about doing these cycles quickly and, and being able to try things, being able to select what works and fail and, and survive that failure and carry on. So this is Microspace Ritfig. Um, Bigel Aerospace have built these uh, prototypes for their space hotel. Uh, I think they're the world's largest microsats, about a ton and a half. Um, you can see... Fail. You can see, <laughs> you can see someone standing here just to, to give an idea of the size. They go up scrunched up around this truss and then inflated on orbit. Oh! Ah, there it is. Okay, great. Technology, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so it goes up. Works sometimes. <laughs> you got my keep up on that. I just can't aim. Anyway, this is far more interesting than a laser pointer, Trust. <laughs> yeah. So, so this one was uh, yeah, a ton and a half went up, scrunched up around the truss, and inflated. But um, Robert Bigelow, I think, was quite courageous in what he did with this. Uh, and um, he threw out uh, the rule book on, on how to build space habs and how to do this kind of mission. These were technology demonstrations to test the, the inflating system. And he just gave us a very short time frame and said, build this thing. Uh, I got pulled in as a sub subcontractor. I can't really claim to be involved in a lot of this. Um, but um, you might know Space Quest in the US. They did a bunch of the avionics and and that's where I got wrapped into it. So there's a, a lot of microsat technology that went into this, but incredibly short time frame. Two of them launched, so there was mission level redundancy. One of them could have died, and we would have fixed the, the problem on the second one and put that up. As it was, they both succeeded very well. Um, they both launched pretty much on time, give or take your standard launch vehicle uh, delays of, of a few months here and there. And um, yeah, excellently successful. So that was a, a really good example, I think, of how size just doesn't matter. And the cost of these compared to what they would have been in a normal development process was, was tiny. Um, so a bit, uh, a bit more about where microsats have been. Um, I think these graphs are, are really nice ones. This is university class spacecraft. Um, and you can see the coming along, we've got these satellites of 40 kilos, then getting smaller, 10 to 40 kilos. And... Um, and then all of a sudden we've got these really tiny ones when the technologies hit that point. And then we hit CubeSats and it just takes off. So uh, the, the modern microsat, sort of an AMSAT invention, the, the, the digipeters and, and things that, that were put up by AMSAT uh, and, uh, and then SSTL and Surrey of course really uh, ran with that, which is fantastic. And now we've got the CubeSats and the CubeSat, the real key to it is, is the interface. What we've done is separate the, the launch vehicle from the satellite by putting it inside this tube. Brilliant idea from, uh, from Bob Twiggs and the guys at, at Cal Poly in Stanford. And you really now can innovate inside this pod and do whatever you want and it's not going to affect the launch vehicle. So heaps of these being launched. Um, state of the art, really, we're pushing the boundaries on all of the things that we're, where size matters. Uh, we can point very, very accurately now. Um, we're deploying solar panels to get more power, which lets us do more comms. Uh, we're going up in frequency so things shrink. 
um, and we can get more bandwidth. Uh, apertures, it's just, you know, Chris is sitting here nodding. He's looking at the linking satellites together to increase the apertures. Uh, people looking at, uh, at deployed systems for those uh, and ways around that. Propulsion is the, uh, the next big thing, and there's a lot of work that's, that's sort of getting us over the hump on those so we can move the CubeSats around, put them in interesting orbits, link them together, fly them in formations, dock them, uh, getting completely away from the limitations that we've had on these really small satellites. So also we've gone from the, the original CubeSat, the, the one unit, which is what the, the standard was written for, Immediately, people thought, "Well, I could do I could do something if I used two of them because the the deployer system was was three in a row. So well, they took two or three, and so that's sort of become the standard. But now people have decided, well, I, I want a bit more aperture. Uh, I can do things more easily. So now we've got a, a six unit design, and you can see this one here with a a telescope to point down, an attitude control system. Um, nice concept. That's uh, that's likely to become somewhat of a standard because you can really do useful things looking at the Earth with that kind of uh, aperture, you get a nice bit of power off the, off the surface, uh, uh, surface mounted solar pa panels or deployed. So there's really a lot of, uh, of technology there. Uh, but something else that um, the CubeSats have, have revolutionized is online shopping. You can now go online and um, you know how much your subsystems are going to cost. You can do your costing and sizing for your mission in, uh, in a half an hour on the CubeSat shop or Clyde Space Shop or, or wherever you happen to be and, uh, and pull out all the, all the subsystems. If you want to develop something, you know, it's, it's a commodity market now. This has completely changed things. I can remember the first time that um, a satellite price was, was put online. Jim Benson from Space Dev was trying to sell a... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, everyone who, who remembers it laughs because at the time it was laughable. And he was trying to sell a Microsat mission uh, and basically you could buy a Microsat on eBay and he was, you know, eBay was taking bids. And at the time, everybody laughed. This was, this was a ridiculous idea. What are people going to do? Now we've broken the satellite down into components and, and you buy them online and it's how everybody does it. This is the way to go. So uh, competition on price, rapid development, uh, easy to get, you, get, on, get into the market. A lot of the barriers to entry have just disappeared. So what are some of the lessons? What's, uh, what's useful? Well. CubeSat builders want things off the shelf. They want short development times, low cost, easy integration. They can't wait for you to do your R&D. If it doesn't exist, they're not going to hang around for an extra year while you build it. So the lesson, get your thing there and put it on the shelf. Um, satellites have spare space. This is an interesting opportunity for AMSAT. There are educational missions. There are satellites that have no end of life mission. Um, they're all using standard interfaces, so they can just put things on the shelf. If you were to come along with a with the payload and just sort of shop it around. Everyone, I have this linear transponder, UV, whatever you want, um, other frequencies, go for it. Make the board, shop it around, people will probably fly it. Uh, you're going to do a lot less paperwork than building your own satellite. It's going to cost you a lot less. Um, there are people who are quite friendly with amateurs, just as we're quite friendly with them. We lend them our frequencies. They quite often will, will make some space available for us. Um, and, uh, and it gives us a chance to better engage with the CubeSat teams and, and bring them into AMSAT. So I think there's a, a whole bunch of opportunities there. What we have to do is make CubeSat compatible boards and, uh, and antennas and just work them into the missions. So that was my sort of big AMSAT lesson. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, some of the other things, the, the satellites shrink, uh, but the paperwork doesn't. The paperwork is expensive. It drives the launch costs. Um, and it drives the satellite cost. So what you want to do is minimize paperwork, but if you don't do any paperwork, you're going to get stuck. You're not going to know how it was built. You won't know how it goes together. You'll end up spending more money trying not to do any paperwork. So you've got to manage it, choose what you're going to do, and justify every document that you do. If one person is designing the power system and the solar panels on the batteries, they don't necessarily need an interface document except to remind themselves what they did. But if it's two separate organizations or two, even two separate people, You've got to make sure those interfaces work, so you've got to think seriously about how you manage your team and where your, your paperwork is needed. But if you get your interface right, or if you just borrow somebody else's interface that they've got right, then you don't have to do the paperwork. You just copy theirs. And this is where you can really start saving things. So the CubeSat revolution is about these interfaces. It's where you make the improvements in systems. We, the, the interfaces might be large and bulky and slow and tacky and, and so last millennia. But 
you can innovate around those interfaces. And you know that it's just going to work. You save yourself that, that time. And uh, I like to, to compare this when people use the, the PC paradigm. I like the Cambrian explosion. Um, when cells finally figured out how to work together and, and form complex multicellular organisms, all of a sudden life sort of took off and, uh, and there was a massive explosion. This is where we're at with, with CubeSats. The CubeSat standards and, and the interfaces that we've got, you can just start plugging these things together. So I'm looking forward to Chris making the, the docking interface standard and all of a sudden we'll have multicellular satellites. And that's the cusp that we're at. So, uh, yeah, the last, um, well, the last thing, one, one of the important things as well is that satellites are made of software. It used to be that um, satellite engineering was in mechanical engineering in, uh, in university, which had come perhaps from the aero industry uh, and, and needing to design, design those structures. But pretty quickly everyone realized that satellites were electronic boxes and you did the mechanical stuff to support a large amount of electronics. These days, satellites are made of software. And software is a curse and a blessing. You can fix everything in software if you have infinite time and resources. Um, Jane King, past president of, of AMSAT NA, uh, he uh, highlighted the, the funnel problem, where uh, if, you're, uh, if you're trying to build your satellite, <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to make sure that it's all working as you bolt it together. And if you've got a... Um, any kind of problems, and there are always problems, you think about how to write the code to fix it. The code is inevitably the last thing that can get written, um, so the last thing that, that gets made, and all of the problems work their way down to the one software guy who's come along to save your project, who's scaring everybody else off because he's got a little empire. And then uh, it, you, you're stuck with this guy who's going to take as long as he's going to take, and nobody else can get close. So beware of software complexity. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Do we have software complexity? Make your satellites reprogrammable so you can launch them without the software if necessary. Um, half of the, the satellites that I've worked on have had the software written uh, once they're in orbit, um, which is which is a good way to get around the uh, the problem of the funnel, but means that then you've got to wait in orbit. Um, and yeah, beware the Lone Ranger software guy. Uh, every project is looking for a software guy, and um, Usually when the Lone Ranger comes along and says, make code and he's really productive, that's great, but you don't want to be stuck with that guy. You really need to enforce your teams. So that's a, an important lesson if you're, uh, if you're trying to build that satellite and, uh, and thinking you can solve it in software. Um, okay, some uh, enabling technologies. These, uh, again, this is just sort of reiterating the, the interface things. Um, it's enabling a whole bunch of, of missions around those interfaces and, and innovation. Yeah. Okay, does that work? Good. Um, yeah, so there are a few useful applications for one unit of CubeSat, but there are unlimited things you can do with the systems inside of one unit of CubeSat. And that's, uh, that's where we're headed. So I've got some more slides which I can go through about sort of where the technology is going and, and, and the like, but um, maybe people have questions about that first. I don't know how I'm going with time. Do we have any? Yeah, you're right. Let's do Carol. Keep going? Okay, these, these are all fairly generic um, CubeSat things. Um, you know, design aspects, small teams, short mission life cycles, uh, modular systems, plug and play, off the shelf, stack them together. Um, so these are standard CubeSat configurations. They come in one unit, two unit, three unit, six unit, 12 unit. Uh, I've heard of 27 unit or 48 unit. Um, and NVSat is a, is a 28,000 unit CubeSat. If you, if you want to really stretch the definition. But what I think is really um, key to the CubeSat is these interfaces. It's the fact that you're inside a tube and therefore isolated from the launch vehicle. The launch companies are happy with that and your paperwork requirements and justification for how you built your satellite becomes a lot less. And then on the inside of the CubeSat, you've got this PC-104 backplane or, or you know, new standards as they come along and you can innovate around that and reuse these things off the shelf plug them in, and more and more as the interfaces get better and more mature, it's plug and play. So we've got a whole bunch going on, off the shelf, plug and play. Um, deployment systems that, uh, that ISIS is looking at, this quad pack, um, there are, which can launch four three-unit satellites, uh, two six-unit satellites, one 12-unit satellite. Um, this is 
this is sort of where it's heading, and there's a, a lot of similar systems being designed out there. Um, as you get to the, the six unit, you've got the, the payload capacity, because one unit is the standard unit that takes care of your housekeeping. Uh, and then you can think about using one unit for attitude control. Uh, and with the three unit, you're still, uh, sorry, the six unit, you're still left with a lot of the payload space. So that's interesting. Uh, and the payloads are getting bigger, more powerful, um, bigger apertures. People are, are looking for that. Um, some of the enabling technologies, uh, comms, dear to our heart. Uh, biggest perceived bottleneck for, for things like Earth uh, observation missions. Um, you know, we don't have high bandwidth comms microsats yet, but uh, we tried to, uh, to beat that with Antarctic broadband. Um, so it's, it's coming along. Um, S-band at one megabit exists these days. Uh, five to 10 megabits is coming. X-band is coming. Um, Antarctic broadband is KA. That's coming. Uh, and with that, you, uh, you see these, uh, these throughputs step up. Uh, and these are all with, with these tiny little satellites. Um, so we can support pretty high data rates now for operational missions. And question for, for AMSAT, where do we want to go? Um, how can we use this to, to do what we love? Uh, other things, attitude control. Uh, reasonably important if you want to point a directional antenna. That's now a solved problem. Uh, you can point a telescope. You can point um, uh, you know, looking up, looking down. Um, lots of things that you can do. So uh, the typical CubeSat uh, systems at the moment are magnet talkers. They'll give you five degrees, something like that. Uh, reaction wheels are now off the shelf, and so people are talking sub one degree. And uh, you know, Star Trek is coming in line, and, and various other sensors. It's all driving down the uh, driving down the size. Standard interfaces again driving down the costs and we can put together quite quickly uh, a high performance mission. Uh, something that we're seeing here is integration. So you can buy a, a complete one unit stack that does all of the attitude control uh, for the satellite and you basically punch in the parameters, the mass properties of the satellite into the software and, uh, and it should start taking care of all of that. Um, those systems are fairly new and, uh, and it'll be interesting to see those develop and mature to the point where they really are plug and play. And uh, that's, uh, that's all coming online. Uh, and what we're seeing is sort of this progression. So the educational outreach CubeSats using their magnet talkers, giving us maybe five degrees. Technology demonstration needs to be a bit better, up to about one degree, starting to look at, uh, at reaction wheels, and then getting into these operational things. And uh, no one knows where it'll go yet. Uh, it really depends on the mission and the creativity of the people who are designing it. Um, yeah, so now it's... Uh, Looking, looking forward, the, some of the missions that, that ISIS are involved with, we're, we're numbering the satellites in the hundreds. Um, debris has, has been mentioned a, a couple of times, and it's a, a, an issue that should be dear to our hearts, um, if only because the regulators are going to come along with a big stick any time now, uh, and in some jurisdictions already have. Um, but the numbers are, are quite large. We, we're not talking about small numbers of these satellites. They're going to be launched en masse. Um, that's already in, in being planned. Um, but the, the big thing is the change in users. Educational users continue, just as we saw with microsats, though, there will be a big shift towards operational systems uh, as the technology comes on. So the hype is a bit over. Now we're trying to figure out how to make them pay, and, uh, and you'll see a lot more of that. Um, that's just sort of deployment systems, um, starting out with the original one, two, three unit, uh, moving on to modular, the... the Quad pack here, uh, sort of different ways to mount them on uh, on structures, and then this is one proposal for the deployment system for QB50. Um, deploying 50 cube satellites off uh, off one launch with a with a microsatellite on top. So you can just imagine the the cluster when this thing sneezes. There's satellites everywhere. It's a whole bunch of new challenges. And uh, how do we coordinate that? Where's Graham? <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that one's a lot of fun. Um, not a trivial challenge. Okay, so that was all the slides that I had. Um, if I've still got time, I guess I can take some questions. Graham. I haven't talked about chipset. Do, do, um, do, have you had any experience with the, the really small ones, or yeah, so the do question, you do you see them at a growth market or just a bit of fun? 
No, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, so many of these things start out as a bit of fun, and then people figure out how to make them pay and, and how to do things with them. Um, I have almost no doubt that that's exactly what will happen with these smaller satellites. Um, it's a question of, of time frames, investment, what people are, are prepared to do, how we're going to deal with all of the new challenges, because there most definitely are challenges to launching um, such small satellites and getting them to, to cooperate and, and the kind of things that people want are uh, looking at doing them. Um, because, just like the, the microsats and then the cubesats even more, because we can iterate so quickly on these, um, the, the technologies will, will advance quickly and the capabilities will advance and soon people will start thinking about applications and, and realise they have the capability for it. Uh, it's not there yet at the moment. They're, they're toys, they're, they're, they're the chips, they're great. Buy one, have fun, see what you can do with it. Um, worry about the problems and figure out solutions for them. There's going to be a lot of people who are working on them fairly soon, I would expect. Yeah, I'm talking more about the launching problem as uh, people such as Virgin are producing um, suborbital craft and, and I'm sure there's talk at some stage of being able to launch with an extra uh, rocket from um, from the satellite holder or whatever. Um, are you talking to people such as, as them uh, about better ways of launching, cheaper ways of launching? Yeah, there, there are quite a few companies that are developing um, suborbital um, most of them are looking at the tourist market, but specifically um, Virgin Galactic, I, I think they took a, a couple of hundred million dollars investment to, um, to build a, a rocket to put on top to do almost exactly what you're describing. So, yeah, people are, are doing it. It will happen. Um, in the US, a lot of that's been driven by uh, defense spending and their, their desire for opera operationally responsive space, which means putting up a satellite if you shoot mine down. Uh, very, very quickly to cover any area of the world. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that are happening. Um, I can't comment on what ISIS is doing. I'm not involved in the, the launch side and, and the organising of launches. But, yeah, e expect to see that. Whether or not that has a, an impact, a, a positive impact on the price and, and, and the volumes uh, often depends on how you do the math. I mean, in the US, you can get a free, con uh, a free launch with Alana by, by putting in the application, and, uh, and there's going to be a lot of spaces there. Uh, if the government's picking up the tab, does that mean that the launch is free? It completely depends how you do the accounting. So how the math will fall on, uh, on these dedicated CubeSat launch or, or NanoSat launch vehicles, uh, at the moment, it's anyone's bet. Uh, I'm, I like to be optimistic, so uh, I'd say that, that it will make an impact. Another one? Well, yes, another one. Um, because I was telling a friend of mine about um, this convention, and the term they used to excuse this is uh, what more crap in space. Um, how well documented are all these cubesats, and how easy will it be for to, to make sure that they, they actually don't become crap in space? Uh, they will become crap in space. Um, they're very, very interesting bits of space junk. Um, the question is, you know, everything that gets launched is crap in space. It's a matter of how dangerous it is and, and how long it hangs around, uh, in what orbits, what the likelihoods are of crashing into it. Um, at the moment, the, the most dangerous place to be is geostationary orbit. It's also the most valuable real estate that we have. Um, so there's a lot of work being done and a lot of coordination being done. The advantage they have in geostationary orbit, uh, and this gets a bit into the economics and the law, is that um, companies own the slots. It's their private real estate. You get to put your satellite in that slot and nobody else can. And it's, you know, Enclosure Act in, in, in England several centuries ago, all of a sudden, <laughs> you, you improve the, the, the quality of the land you own. So there are now cooperative agreements and a lot of, of um, bureaucracy around maintaining and preserving and increasing the value of that real estate. So I say we sell low Earth orbit to, uh, I'll take 600 to 800 kilometres. Um, <laughs> no, uh, but the... There's a lot of work going into projecting the, the geo ring because it's so valuable and, and because companies have those specific places. In LEO, it's a lot different um, because you're not in, in a slot that is so well defined. It's, uh, it's hard to tell everyone else to keep out. Uh, so we have rules coming in and that's what we're going to have to respect. Uh, the rules now at the moment, the guideline is to deorbit uh, in less than 25 years. 
So then you, you would go into an orbit that just through atmospheric drag and, and change of the orbit will bring you back into the atmosphere where, where it will burn up. Um, that's, a, that's a good way to do it, but then that introduces other difficulties. So the industry at the moment is really wrestling with this and hasn't come to terms with it, but it's something that we're, that, that's improving. It's, it's the front of a lot of people's mind now. Uh, and there are steps being taken to, to reduce the debris, reduce the chances of explosions, which are the, the biggest cause of, of fragments. Um, in terms of your, your first question, how well are these tracks, how well are they known? Um, so far, CubeSats are contributing a very small, uh, and Microsats are contributing a very small part of the, the debris problem, if you like. Um, there haven't been fragmentation events of, of CubeSats, mainly because we don't carry propulsion. And it's, it's uh, most of the particles up there are because of, of explosions of, of propellant tanks that weren't passivated, they weren't vented. These days we vent the tanks, there's a whole bunch of good things that are done uh, by responsible operators. So that's all changing. We don't let O-rings fly off into space. We try and capture them all and, and keep them attached. This, this used to happen. The rocket would go up and, and pieces would just come off all over the place. And that was an excellent design when space was empty and nobody worried about it. But as space you know, seems to fill up, there's a lot more activity, uh, it means that we want to minimize those possibilities. So there are activities that are, that are being done to, to slow down the, the increase in debris, and there are concepts being put forward to, to reduce the debris. But it's not a trivial problem, it's not a solved problem, and it's one that we're going to have to deal with. Thank you. Any more questions? Any from the web? Nope. Right, thank you very much.